Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Haug. Uh, I'm the chapter director of the Columbia Mid-Maryland Chapter of Startup Grind, and I can't tell you how thrilled we are to have you all here tonight. Um, for those of you who do not know, Startup Grind is the largest independent global community of entrepreneurs. Um, as of two weeks ago, we topped 2 million members in 550 cities and 130 countries worldwide. The mission is we're here to educate, inspire, and connect our community members with the resources that they need to have the greatest opportunity of growing a phenomenally successful business. We have three very simple core values. We give first, we don't take. We help others before we help ourselves. And we look for ways to make partnerships, friendships, and collaborate with one another, not just hand out business cards. One of the big news is that I would really like to celebrate, and that is, where is he? Um, Jerry? Jerry Bory? There he is. Last Tuesday night, we celebrated the launch of our new Frederick Startup Grind chapter. The new chapter director is Mr. Jerry Bory. Jerry, stand up, take a bow. So Startup Grind Columbia has signed on with them to be an early adopter beta tester um, of their platform um, as, we, as they roll it out. And we're thrilled that we're up and operational and we, I think we've worked out some of the bugs. I'm not sure we worked them all out yet, but we're getting there. Never been. So you've got three minutes and that's it. Okay, terrific. <laughs> thank you very much. First and foremost, we'd like to thank Chris and his team, you know, Joe, Ellen, Patrick, and Josh. You guys are the uh, the real energy that make all of this happen. He just gets to stand up here and get all the applause. But uh, you guys, have, uh, I've, I've gotten to know you over the course of the last uh, nine, ten months, and uh, you've been great partners to work with here. Show of hands here real quickly. Who, how many people out there know about Trouble, have downloaded Trouble, you know, are aware of it? So for the rest of you, I'll give you a quick overview. Treble is business networking reinvented. Um, it really has been designed to empower you to engage, grow, and most importantly, leverage your trusted network of contacts as you try to uh, generate new business opportunities and uh, pursue your career advancement goals. Um, it really is best described in, a, in five words, which is it's a CRM for your networking activity. That's what it does for you. And it does it digitally, and it does it very efficiently. And, and because everybody's doing things on a mobile platform these days, when you're meeting people and, and like, you know, I, my tax accountant just retired, or I need a digital marketing firm to help me as, a, as I'm looking to expand. And your first reaction is, oh, I know somebody. Let me introduce you. Or rather than taking card back and hammering out the same old email time and time again, we've automated that process for you so that you can quickly pull out your phone. And if I had a third hand, I would do it right now. Um, <laughs> and open the app and quickly just connect them through email and make a quick introduction. You can use voice to text on the fly to edit the message and customize it so that people know exactly why you're reaching out to them. Um, it really is a, a, a wonderful platform that's been designed to help you with your networking activities. It also has a component built into it called the Wish Engine, which is really cool. It allows you to passively crowdsource your business goal. So if you're looking for new clients, you can tell people. You can go to a networking event and there could be 100 people there and unless you run around and introduce yourself to 99 other people and tell them exactly what you're looking for, you may not find that one person in the room that actually could help you. But by putting it out there on this platform, people can look at, at it, they can search for it, they can see how, they, how, how and where they might be able to help you and make those introductions, those referrals for you. So it really is a great way for you to help achieve some of your business goals by putting it out there and letting people know what you're looking for. Um, Quickly, if you, um, if you don't know, part of Treble's philosophy is uh, the secret to successful network networking is really helping others first. It's really trying to build those relationships, those strong relationships by doing something, being altruistic and helping people first. Well, if you just heard Chris, one of the things he told you about the, the Startup Grind mission statement is we give. You know, we give, we don't take. And so if you, if you look at that, and, and they're trying to make meaningful connections, right? So if you think about it, you know, we're out there to help people first, and he's out there telling us that the startup community is going to give and help everybody else achieve whatever their goals are. It, was, it, it made perfect sense for us to form an alliance, to form this partnership, um, and we're really pleased that, the, that we have done so. And so since we're in the, the, um, the, the time of the year, which is Thanksgiving, you know, and, and rolling into that season of giving, 
Um, I thought it would be great to try to weave all of this together. Um, and we approached Chris and, and, <coughs> Joe and Ellen about this several months ago, and we've come up with an idea to have a contest. And a contest to help you get familiar with the app, uh, understand what the app can do for you. Um, and so we've got two different categories that we're going uh, to, to uh, uh, measure some data and statistics on for you to win a prize. The first is uh, the most number of invitations that you can send out. So if you have a good network and you can download the app, and, I'm, and I'll get into the details on this at a later date, but get you up and running, makes those connections, introduce yourself uh, to, to your network saying, I'm using this networking app, and then go look at wishes and try to fulfill some of the wishes that are already out there. We already have over a thousand users that are on the platform. We, our go-to-market strategy was local, and we've got 11 different organizations. You can join additional organizations if you want to network even further. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can do, and I can inform all of, all of you about this during some of the webinars we have. Every Thursday, we have a 3 o'clock webinar that is open format. If, if people are there and, and they have specific questions, we can address it. If you've never been or you're a first-time user, I can walk you through some of the setups, answer your questions, whatever you need. But this is also where we can go over and talk about some of the contest stuff. Speaking of which, uh, Startup Grind will push out notices, so look for some notices about the contest and the details and how to get started. Um, if, you do, if you download the Travel app, please make sure you join the Startup Grind organizations. It's the second tab right underneath your profile when you, when you start filling out information. So look for the organizations. You'll see Startup Grind Columbia. There's a little arrow there. You click on that. It sends a message to these guys here. Patrick will see it. He'll accept you, and you'll become part of the Startup Grind Columbia organization. So. We've got two contests, most invites and the most wishes granted. Um, the winner of the most invites will get an Echo, um, an Amazon Echo, and the most uh, wishes granted uh, will get an Echo Dot um, as, as the prizes for each of these. Um, and last but not least, um, we have this thing called Trouble Tuesday. We put messages out on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, every Tuesday talking about how you can network, how you, tips and tricks on how to do networking better so they can help you continue to build and grow your network. So if you haven't already, please download the app. It's under Trouble Network, all one word. It, by the time you get to the end of network, all the music apps will disappear and there'll be one thing that shows up on the screen, which is Trouble Network. Um, so uh, download that and then uh, go ahead and look for us on LinkedIn, Facebook. You'll see messages that are posted out there about how to use the app and what the app can do for you as an individual user. So thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. I probably was about five minutes. I apologize. <laughs> because I'm so enthusiastic. <laughs> and it's my joy to introduce to you this evening, Mr. Jason Tagler. Jason is the general, part, general partner and managing member of a local uh, private equity growth capital uh, firm called Camden Partners. I am not gonna get into the long involved uh, you know, details. Suffice it to say, he comes from a technology background, graduated in economics, and has his MBA from Cornell. Started his career in technology with PricewaterhouseCoopers, and the rest, as they say, is history. He has been in the investment banking um, world in some facet for, I believe, the last eight, 16, 15, 20 years. Yeah. And he knows what he talks about. And over this period of time, he has seen thousands and thousands and thousands of pitches. And he's seen tens of thousands of thousands of thousands of mistakes. And so it, what Jason decided to do is, as a personal mission, to spill his 20 plus years worth of listening to mistakes into a program called Pitch Creator. Jason is a, you know, is a fellow startup, just like a lot of us are. He, it's just now coming out of the ground. And matter of fact, it's, it's a little more than just out of the ground. It's going through its next level of, um, uh, of growth. But I thought, what better way to help teach us the right way to go about communicating with investors and lenders than to bring in the man who probably better than any of us can speak to that. So without further ado, Mr. Jason Tagler of Pitch Creator and Camden Partners. Jason. Thank you very much. You know, um, I met Chris for the first time and I could tell right away that we had a lot in common in terms of um, just values, passion for entrepreneurship and approach. And I think the same is true for Pitch Creator and Startup Grind. So I'm really excited to be here. It's really my pleasure and I appreciate you inviting me. 
So um, hopefully I can get a little bit of length out of this thing. So um, Pitch Creator is, is it's a startup in that it, it's an evolving revenue model, but it's really my passion project. And I founded Pitch Creator in 2014 with the goal of creating jobs, mainly initially in the Baltimore area. Is this, is this helping you guys? Can you, is this working? Hopefully it is. Um, and the idea, the way I was gonna create jobs was by helping entrepreneurs learn how to communicate with investors and lenders to raise capital for the business. So that was the premise of how we started. Since then, we've expanded to um, an online learning platform and we've um, expanded our geography to multiple states. So that's, that's sort of the, the beginnings of Pitch Creator. And, you know, I guess I'd like to start just get a sense from the room. So who's an entrepreneur? I know you guys are entrepreneurs. So just raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur working on a startup, working on a company right now. Who, okay, great. Who's an investor? Okay, incubator. I know you have raised a couple. Um, like a, a instructor, coach, any kind? Okay. And then back to the entrepreneurs, who has raised, who has raised um, an angel round? How about a seed round? Okay. The seed round? All right, we've got a good group here. So this, I think this is gonna be, uh, we've got a lot of experience. Uh, so unlike this cartoon, um, you know, this is, this is a news flash. Raising equity capital is actually not easy. <laughs> so statistically, in, uh, angel investors will evaluate 40 companies for everyone they invest in. So they invest in about 2.5% of the companies that they invest in. Venture capital firms actually invest in approximately in less than 1%. So they look at 100. The US Small Business Association recently said that sometimes they have statistics that VCs will look at close to 400 for each one that they invest in. So that is the bad news. Uh, the good news is uh, that just, you know, today we're gonna help you improve those odds slightly. If you go to our website, uh, we've got some free courses on there. One free mini lesson or mini uh, course is called, why is the readme pitch more important than the slide deck? Just watching that mini course will help you improve your odds. So along with the same idea of the values of giving first, when you go to our website, the first thing you'll see is, you know, three pieces of free content, mini courses, mini lessons, and I'm working to continue to expand those. One of the things that we'll do later is uh, a little mini lesson as well. <coughs> the, the extra good news is that our courses actually work. So they, we, you know, real entrepreneurs in the real world have raised real capital using our courses. So just the entrepreneurs who have volunteered testimonials for our website uh, have collectively raised $70 million. And we use a very sophisticated Daniel Analytics platform to track this once a year or twice a year, I send them an email, and I ask them how they're doing, and they tell me. And I love, I love that called AI machine learning? It's exactly what it is. And you know, I, 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 you know, someday, when this is more than just a volunteer passion project, we're just tracking what everyone does and everyone takes the courses, but for right now, that's our best metric for you know, how people are really using this in the real world. And some of the reason the number is big is uh, well, I'll get into how I designed the course, but I actually start designed the course for later stage investors, like what I do at Camden Partners, and I made it work for earlier stage. So there's some folks who you know, who've raised over $10 million because they're later stage companies, and then there's some people that, you know, if you were looking at the looping testimonials that you know, use Pitch Career to win the Accelerate Baltimore program in the first 100 grand in first seed fund. So today we're gonna cover the you know, why and how Pitch Creator challenges that entrepreneurs face, solutions that we offer, and then finally at the end we'll cover fundraising strategy, which is sort of a mini lesson, and it's my favorite one to teach. And I had to negotiate with Chris, I'm like, can I teach this and the fundraising? And he said yes. So that's what we're gonna to try to cover today. This last one's a really important topic because it's something that you can use, this fundraising strategy is something you can use for your existing company or um, companies in the future. And it answers the question of, should I actually be raising equity? Apple or not, what's my strategy around fundraising? So let's start with the origin story, sort of the why of Pitch Creator. In 2014, I asked myself the question, how can I make a big, bigger impact in the Baltimore area? I was doing some different volunteer things. I used to volunteer with Year Up, which is a um, workforce development uh, company. 
And you know, I wish I knew how to get guns off the street, decrease violence, improve our education system in Baltimore City. I don't know how to do any of that, but I saw this opportunity of a way to create jobs, and it was a really around this sort of problem that I saw, where uh, uh, people, uh, you know, incubator directors like Deb would say, "Oh, I wish angel investors would invest. Uh, angel investors in the East Coast would invest the way that angel investors on the West Coast invest." And I said, "Yeah, I think that's some of the problem." But when I go to these pitching events, these angel events, and things like that. You know, three out of the four pitches, no one's going to invest in these companies because they can't communicate with investors and, and lenders. And my very simple goal was if I could help one entrepreneur per year, you know, learn how to communicate with investor and raise equity or debt capital, that would create jobs. So that's what we started with. And, um, and it's really about, you know, learning how to communicate with folks and creating jobs in Baltimore, strengthening the, um, the ecosystem. And, um, you know, what, what I started with was teaching classes. So I started teaching classes at the ETC, that was my first class. And I started teaching those classes and then holding office hours to see what people were learning and were not learning. And I usually get a chuckle, people were like, you held office hours? Yeah, I actually did. Because uh, I wanted to see what, you know, what was going on. And I learned a lot and I adapted what I was teaching live just live classes with very ugly looking slides that are not as nice as the slides that we have today, which were out in court, I'll see my graphics design. And, um, and then uh, I was looking for materials to, to have people read before the class or after the, the class that I was teaching, and I couldn't find anything good. I couldn't find anything that was really curated. Everything's really heavily focused on the slide deck. What you'll learn is we actually teach everything backwards from the way that everyone else is teaching it. We teach the slide deck at the end and we, we teach what we call the investment summary reading pitch at the beginning. So I had already changed the way I was, I was teaching at this point and I couldn't find anything. There's a lot of stuff scattered on the internet. It's not curated, it's not organized. And the other thing I learned from Deb and working with Deb's cohort is entre a lot of Deb's entrepreneurs were working full time or maybe half time while they were in the incubator, they didn't have a lot of extra time. So how do you compress this material down in a way that makes it really efficient for the entrepreneur to learn how to create an effective pitch to investors? How do you do that quickly and efficiently? So that was really the goal that we started with and um, the why of how this course was developed. So next, quickly, I'll just go through my background so you understand um, you know, where this all came from. So for the last 13 years, I've been working in private equity at Camden Partners. Camden is a late stage growth equity firm, so we invest in companies that are later than venture capital. So typically these companies are even up, break even. They've reached eight to 10 million of revenue. So roughly you could think of venture capital as how do you go from zero to three or zero to five or maybe zero to eight. But then once you're at that eight level, the question of scaling and growing, how do you go from 10 to 50 or 10 to 100 is a completely different process and approach. And a lot of times it's a different CEO at that point. But that's what I, that's what I do at Camden. And I've seen you know, roughly 1,000 pitches because it's, it's sort of you know, 100 a year, it's two per week, Camden, angel groups, things like that. The numbers add up a lot when you've been to the same place doing the same thing for 13 years. Um, and uh, I would just want to point out my colleague, uh, Calvin Young, who works at Camden as well. He's a part-time coach for pitch creator, so he will, in addition to our classes, like we just finished up a project with the University of Baltimore, they'll use our online course, and then they'll also, you know, Calvin will work with them to do like a wraparound custom coaching to help those entrepreneurs in the Entrepreneurship Center sort of accelerate their learning. And then um, prior to private equity, I worked in investment banking, so I was helping CEOs take their companies public. What do you do when you take a company public? You develop a read me pitch, which is an executive summary, and you develop a listen to me pitch, which is a slide deck. And you go on a road show, and you actually take these CEOs and CFOs around to T. Rowe Price, Leg Mason, and all those other mutual funds all over the country and in Europe, and you pitch them your company, and that's, a, that's the process of going public. Then I worked in a boutique investment bank in Silicon Valley um, and we were advising lower middle market technology companies on their sale to bigger companies. 
So how do you, in this case, if you're a five to 50 million revenue size company and you're selling yourself to a bigger company, you would hire a boutique investment bank to help represent you, help you negotiate, help create an auction process to get the maximum value that you could for your company. A, a, um, a readme pitch, an executive summary, or what we call an investment summary, and you create a list to me pitch, which is a slide deck, and then you go present that as well. So it was the combination uh, of these experiences that led to the aha moment for me, which was regardless of whether you're arranging an angel round, or you're taking your company public, or it's anything in between, there are basic components of the way that you pitch investors that are the same. Not everything's the same, but there are basic components that are the same. So from that point on, my mission was, you know, how can we develop a situation where just like painting by numbers, any entrepreneur, any uh, CEO, could create a effective pitch to investors and do it quickly and efficiently. It had to be quickly and efficiently. That was really important. So the course is built on learning objective. It's built on a learning framework and sort of a building block approach to create that efficiency that we needed. And it was just kind of, you know, the years of, of like trial and error to keep trying and redoing and redoing. So today we have three main courses. The first course is the foundation course. Um, which is geared towards individual entrepreneurs. You can buy that course on our website. If you go to our website, there's plenty of, um, there's free resources as well. You can click to some of the articles and things that are on the website, which are, are also free. Um, next is the university course, which we developed and sort of customized specifically for universities. So these are entrepreneurship professors or instructors who have a short tank event at the end of their entrepreneurship class and they want to prepare the students for that um, event. So they'll use our course in parallel with that to prepare them. And then finally, this year, we just developed an incubator course, which is specifically designed for incubators um, to help them prepare their entrepreneurs for investor pitch events, for demo days. And hopefully we'll be, you know, be working with the Columbia chapter here to do something with you probably around this course or in the case of UB's Entrepreneurship Center, they use that course plus Calvin's coaching to prepare their entrepreneurs. So for instructors, we don't have a ton of instructors in this room. Do we have any instructors in this room? Okay, we've got one instructor. So I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> Most of the rest of the presentation is geared towards entrepreneurs, but you know, if some of these challenges resonate with you, you can go to our website in the header on the upper right, there's an instructor's drop-down box. You can drop down and choose either university or incubator instructors and there's pages there that are specifically geared towards instructors. But next, let's talk about challenges that entrepreneurs face and how we help to address them. So if you think about it, as a CEO or entrepreneur, you have two main jobs. Getting the right people on the bus from the book Good to Great, meaning how do you get the right people in the right seats, right? And then you have to be able to pay those people to retain them. You need to attract them and then retain them. It sounds really easy, I could say it that way. We all know if you're an entrepreneur, it's actually not that easy. But you know, if you need to raise growth capital, there's two more important realizations that you need to make that I don't think anybody, or not everyone realizes, so I'll just point them out. Um, the first realization is if your company needs growth capital, and what we're gonna talk about in the last section is needs, you know, absolutely needs growth capital, then the most important job for you as the CEO entrepreneur uh, is that fundraising. And the reason is, it is the one job that you absolutely cannot outsource to someone else. Um, it's gotta be done by you, um, and you're the only person who can do it. In comparison, you're recruiting, um, hiring and training people can be outsourced, sales can be outsourced, and pretty much every other function, it absolutely have to, has to be, you have the money, can be outsourced, except this one. And then the second realization is, if you're the CEO, you have the highest opportunity cost of time of anyone in the company. Right? So while you're raising capital, that's time you could be spent recruiting your team, building your product, marketing sales, you know, distribution, and all those other things. It's also time the competitors are keep catching up to you. Another challenge in, um, that uh, that you know entrepreneurs face is this challenge of investors are a different type of customer. They have their own language. So that's a big thing um, for people, particularly first time entrepreneurs to understand that, you know, when you're communicating with investor, 
they're a different type of customer. You're not approaching them the same way that you would approach a customer for your products and services. You have to learn how to speak their language. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons that people struggle and one of the things we help people with. Um, and it's not that um, entrepreneurs in this area or in other places are really smart and really motivated. It's just that they don't get a lot of practice interfacing with this particular type of customer, which is the investor. Even if you're a repeat entrepreneur, even if you've raised the angel money before, you've only done it a few times. You know, unless you've taken your company public and you've gone on a roadshow and done, you know, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of pitches, you've worked with investment bankers who've taken you through the process before, you don't have a lot of experience with how to do this. And then I'll just close this section with a common question that we get, which is, and so you know, we get it from all types of folks, but typically the first time entrepreneur has this. That, you know, it's a good company. You know, why does the investor care? You know, how, how the quality of the presentation, I mean, what's the big deal? Like, it's a good company, just, you know, what's the, what's the big deal? Well, there's actually a few big deals. There's a few reasons why it matters. But um, one reason is, in addition to understanding the business and the revenue model, investors are inferring multiple things from that short period of time that you're in front of. So let's walk through what they're inferring. They're referring, are you passionate, right? If you're not passionate about your business, then why should someone invest in it? They're inferring, are you committed? Because no one's gonna invest in the business if you're gonna bail when the going gets rough. Right? They wanna know that when the going gets rough, you're gonna dig in and double time it. Um, I describe it as the only thing that I know, the only thing that is a given when we make an investment in a company is there are gonna be speed bumps and there's gonna be roadblocks. That is the only thing I know. <laughs> And there's gonna be a point in time where that CEO is gonna put the whole company on their back and they're gonna run it around the speed block or they're gonna grind it over the speed bump. Literally everything else is an unknown. And they're, gonna try, they're also gonna be inferring, can you sell the customers, right? Because if you can't even pitch me, <laughs> then you probably are not gonna be really good at selling your customers. And by the way, that also, that also um, applies to getting the people on the bus. Right? Are you going to be able to recruit the right team? And then this last one seems to be elusive. Um, it's obvious to me, but particularly if it's early stage, right? If it's an early stage company, and I'm an angel investor, and you you can't communicate with me really well. Again, what do I? The only thing that's known to me is that if I give you money, you're, it's an early stage company. You're going to need to raise more. You're not going to be able to do it, and I just lost my money. So. I'm gonna wait for one of those other 40 companies that has an angel investor I look for, for somebody else who's got a good idea, and bet on them, because at least, at least they've got a shot at raising money the next time. So those are the things they're inferring from that pitch. Um, if you watch the you know, free lesson or free mini course on the website, what you'll learn is by doing that um, uh, read me pitch in advance, you're effectively pre-pitching them, and so that when you go in and, and do your listening pitch with your slide deck, you're having a conversation here instead of like at the ground floor. It gives you all kinds of advantages because even if you screw it up, they've already been pre-pitched and it helps you out. There's other hidden advantages of the two, which I'm not going to go into because I have that fabulous free course that I spent a lot of time putting up there. So let's, let, let's talk about our solution next and our courses. Um, and they're broken, down, they're broken down into learning modules that, you know, I think one of the things that makes our courses different, as I mentioned, is we teach it backwards. Everybody else focuses on the slide deck. If you go on the internet, I, I was actually trying to write this article. I wrote this article. I thought it was getting published in Forbes, and they rewrote it and basically skipped the important point, which is that here's the important point. If you want to create a pitch to investors and do it efficiently, do not start with the slide deck. If you want to have a really inefficient process, then by all means, do that. But it's not the efficient way to do it. And it was just, it, it made me laugh because the editor rewrote it back into this like slide deck thing is where you start. So I don't know, yeah, I, I, that's what sort of exists out there. And that's one of the things that makes us a lot different. You know, Jason, you, you mentioned something. I went out and did a Google search and I said, you know, investor pitches and like 350 million yeah. references. And I then went out and I searched on investor executive summary. 
than we're like me. Yeah. Which means that if I'm hearing you correctly, the entire industry literally is focused on the wrong thing at the wrong time. Right, because the other thing is, how do you get to do that slide? What's the process of getting to the point where you're up in front of any sort of investor group, whether it's angels or VC or C, that you're presenting the slide deck? What happens before that? Somewhere along the line, you submit something to someone that they have to read without you being there. And if you haven't nailed that, which is your investment summary, you're not gonna be pitching anyone, anyway. you know? So that's the key thing. So you start with this investment summary, and, and if, this is where this is the this is our basic learning framework. You start with this. The way we do it is it's sort of a term sheet type of approach, like a two to three pager, and you're just basically you know going through key concepts that are important, and you're writing them out. And just by forcing yourself to write them out, sometimes you you know you realize oh they didn't really have this figured out. Then force yourself to get it down to four sentences or less, or three sentences or less. You know the old um, Mark Twain quote is. Uh, you know, I would have written you a short letter, but I didn't have enough time, so I wrote you a long one instead. It takes a lot of effort to distill down, right? Then you got to then you, you do all that, and then you go and you meet with your mentors and advisors, and you walk through all those key business points. That, by the way, are the talking points of your whole bitch and the basis of your slide deck later. So this thing is really an outline, right? If you think about writing a college paper, you wouldn't just start. You know, you'd sit down and write an outline first, and then you'd start writing the paper based on the outline. You break it down. That's what you're really doing here. But you're doing a lot of res with your advisors, or you know, at UB with Calvin as well. And you're getting a lot of feedback right there, right? Think about the inefficient way of doing it. Start with your slide deck. Let's start iterating with your slide deck, with graphics and stuff. Make it really slow and painful, so that before you get very far, you're totally exhausted. You know. And you're burned out, and you didn't, and then you don't have a good pitch. And then, by the way, you don't have a readme pitch anyway. <laughs> you never built that. So you start with this. That's what we do. We do. We put a lot of emphasis on this part. The nice thing about this as well is you can get reds with your mentors, advisors on it, redline via email. You know, usually when I do this, I don't even talk to. It's like I'm just going to send you a redline and come back with the second version before I even talk to you. Calvin's a lot nicer. Like he'll talk to you <laughs> about the first one. All right, no. Unless it's really good, I'm just giving you a red line. But it's an efficient way to get feedback. Because you know, ideally, you want to, we tell people, get, get three different mentors and advisors to rev on this three times. Right? Put the effort in here, and that's a really strong outline that's going to serve you so well down the road. Because by the time you get done with the whole thing, then we go build the elevator pitch. Because that's the summary of your college paper. You wouldn't build that at the beginning, because you don't know what the hell you're saying yet. Right? So you do that at the end. but. This is where you put in the time. This is where the uh, instructor, you put in most of your time. Then once they've mastered this and the instructor signed off or Calvin signed off, all right, we've got a decent outline. We've run through at least the key topics that they need to know. Now we move on. We learned some basic presentation skills that are really applicable to presenting to investors. It's literally like the bare minimum. Um, and then the, part of this is you know, it takes some of the pressure off too. What what we you find in a lot of the slides of the inexperienced people, it's like it's all cluttered up with stuff. It's like there's graphs and stuff jammed in there. So when they go and put it up on the screen, the investors trying to read the stuff, they're not paying attention because we human animals can really only do one thing at a time. They can listen or you know read what's on the screen. So by doing this here, the investor gets this in advance. It takes a lot of the pressure off in terms of feeling like I gotta cover all this information because they already have it all. This is designed towards basic presentation skills, but also don't clutter up your slides. Just some like basic stuff to realize that this thing has not set you up to have a really efficient slide deck listen to me process. Because what you're really doing is you're taking these talking points and you're just creating pictures and graphs and, and things that help support your verbal presentation. You don't have to jam the whole world in there. Great story, $15 million company, CFO copies the Excel file of this financial model and pastes it into the slide deck in the financial, you know, in the financial slide. I mean, it literally, I see it, it happens, and I'm not talking about this is a first time entrepreneur with $100,000 of revenue per year. Everybody does it. 
All right, benefits to the entrepreneur and the investor, we can go pretty quick here. I'm not checking time, so no, go ahead. You, you know, You're fine. let me know. Um, fast and efficient, we talked about that, and it addresses this uh, opportunity across the time. Everything was built around that. Thanks, thanks Deb, for uh, you know having those entrepreneurs who are working full time. Forced us to figure this out early. And then, you know, for the mentors, instructors, same thing, you're saving time. It also creates a hurdle. You know, it creates a hurdle when you're getting an app, you know, Deb gets 100 applications or 150 applications if she's gonna take a cohort of six, right? <laughs> Pretty, you know, you can weed some of them out right away because if they didn't put the effort in to do the investment summary, it gives you a good sense of, you know, how much grind they're gonna put in towards the whole program. They're also very coachable. I talk about a continuum of zero to 100. 100 is you've perfected your pitch and you've been funded, right? You should be able to go to zero to 50 on your own just by taking our, our course. Then it's so much easier for that coach to take you from 50 to 100 because you put the time in. Where in a lot of cases, a lot of entrepreneurs will get 50, 60, 70% on their own. The ones who work really hard will do that, they'll get 70 on their own, they'll work really hard with their mentors or advisors, will go the whole way. You know, and they'll raise uh, their first angel cap, you know, angel round without really any other help. And obviously, as a mentor or an instructor, if you're saving time, you can impact more people at the same time, and it's just a heck of a lot more fun. So you don't have to waste time on the basic stuff. So how is the course different? Um, there's a number of different ways, but I, I would really break them down into two categories. One's the speed and efficiency that we just talked about. Two is the flexibility. Because I really designed it for late stage companies, and then they said, oh, I need to create jobs in Baltimore, let me make this work for early, early stage companies as well. In the course of doing that, and it, we, I also approached it from the IPO process and selling your company, it's, it's very flexible, so it's, um, I think of it in terms of learning basic communication skills that are applicable to any type of company, any stage, any financing, any CEO entrepreneur. So, particularly in the Baltimore area, University of Baltimore, these are small businesses. They're not high growth, you know, West Coast startups. We're working with some upstate New York companies, Utica College, Mohawk Valley Community College. These people are raising money for food trucks, hair salons, services businesses, right? And the goal, remember, of Pitch Career is create jobs in Baltimore, so it had to work, for, and it had to be very flexible. My big goal for 2019 is, this course works well for small business loans. And I really, I'm gonna make one ask. My ask is, I wanna find a bank that's willing to do a trial with us to uh, use this course to make it faster for loan officers at banks to evaluate business loans because you've read Mary Miller's report. Has anybody read that report other than Calvin? Yeah, so basically what this report says is, you know, over the last 10 years, Banking deposits have been going up and small business loans have been going down. And given what we all know about Baltimore, more companies, this, this organization is fantastic and there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna raise equity capital in this group. But if you look at Baltimore as a whole, Baltimore needs more small business loans, more than they need equity capital. So we have to fix that problem. That's my big thing next year. Thanks some other big things. <laughs> All right, so I talked about any CEO. So if you saw the loop, here's a first time CEO and she's addressing this issue of, um, hey, I wish, it took me 18 months and I wish I could have compressed this down to, you know, four weeks or six weeks with our course. Um, here is the person who won the uh, Accelerate Baltimore program, uh, $100,000 in seed funding this year. So, you know, first time CEO, first seed capital. Repeat CEO, does anybody know Chris Sleep? Um, Chris has raised a lot of capital. This was the first year that we did, I don't even, we didn't even have the, I don't know if we even had the E guys yet. We were just doing it at Betamore the first year. And um, you know, he, he said, wow, this thing really, you know, going back and starting with the basics and starting forcing him to start all over again, he said it really helped in the honest message. And here's Deb, mm -hmm. she'll, she'll be, talking up at the end here in the um, fireside chat section, but she's addressing this issue that we talked about earlier is it's really a different language, right? It's not hard, it's not rocket science, you just need to learn that different language. So next let's get into fundraising strategy, if we, if we still have enough time. Okay. 
So what, you know, this is addressing the question of should you raise capital for your business, and even if the right strategy for your business is to raise venture capital, which we'll, you know, we'll show you the matrix and we'll figure that out, you, know, you should try to be as capital efficient as possible. What we'll talk about at the end is a little dilution example to explain why you should try to achieve as many milestones as you possibly can, take advantage of as, as, um, as much non-dilutive financing as you possibly can, get as far as you can because it's gonna help you in the wrong, long run in terms of dilution to your business, which we'll talk about at the end. So there's, you know, how you should finance your company depends on a lot of factors, but there's really two driving factors. And if you can figure these two things out, they're gonna help you figure out what your fundraising strategy is. So does anyone wanna guess, does anyone know what they are or wanna guess what they are? Somebody's got to guess, otherwise I can't move on. So someone's got to throw out something. <laughs> Debt or equity? Debt or equity? Okay. Cash flow. That's one of them. Yeah. So the first one is how big is the market that you're addressing? Right. What's the total addressable market? Um, you know, how big is this opportunity that you're going after? And the second one is how much cash flow do you need to get to break even? If you know those two things, we can figure out what your fundraising strategy should be. Mm. And we're gonna do it on this little matrix. <coughs> when I used to teach this on a whiteboard, it never failed that someone would take a picture of this. So that's why I said I gotta turn this into a slide and make it look a little bit better. So we're gonna start in the lower left. Quadrant, it's a small um, opportunity, but a small investment's required. This is a small business, maybe a lifestyle business. And the strategy is to bootstrap this Anyone know what bootstrapping is? I'm hoping a lot of people know, <laughs> right? It's self-funding, right? So this is the website design firm that you started in your dorm room. Um, it could be a $10 million lifestyle business that you know you and your co-founder realize that you're not gonna sell this thing for a lot, but it generates cash flow, right? <clears throat> All right, the upper left quadrant is, is, it requires a high degree of cash flow in terms of investment to get to break even but it's a small opportunity. Does anybody know what this is? This is a walk away. It's a not viable <laughs> business. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna pivot, right? You're gonna get in there, and you're gonna get out the lead startup, and you're gonna do some tests and learns, and you're gonna work with your mentors, advisors, and you're gonna figure out a way to pivot, pivot, and pivot, and take what you learned, and it, maybe it's scrap the whole thing and start again, but you're gonna figure out a way to take what you've learned, because you've You've learned a lot that's very valuable from going down this path, and you're figuring out a way to get this thing into one of the other three quadrants. You just kind of get it out of the upper left <coughs> somehow. Right, that's your goal. But don't give up. Right? You can't give up. That's a classic holy shift, right? Yeah, there we go. Holy shift. Make it happen. The right uh, upper right quadrant, if you are in this quadrant, then you are truly viable business for venture capital. It's a very large market. It's a huge opportunity. It's going to require a lot of cash flow to get there. You're not going to be able to bootstrap this off your credit cards. If it is a good opportunity and you have a good team and you have a good experience and like 5,000 other things that venture capitalists want, you're a candidate to raise venture capital. The bottom right quadrant is my favorite one because I just think it's really interesting. It's a large opportunity, but it's taking a small amount of cash investment to get to break even. Okay, so raise of hands, who thinks this is a really good quadrant to be in? Who wants to be in this quadrant? Okay, who doesn't want to be in this quadrant? Anyone? One, one person doesn't want to be in this quadrant. So the answer is everybody's right, because it depends, okay? It depends on if you've got a moat. Okay, if you don't have a moat, then you're in a situation where you start doing well, very small investment for competitors to come in. I'm not even a professor at Loyola, and I can tell you that as soon as those competitors come in, they're gonna drive down your margin to the point that everybody's basically you know, operating with razor thin you know, grocery store margins. But, if you have a moat, this could be a great investment because that means there's a barrier to entry for your competitors to come in 
And now, with a small amount of investment, you can go after this big opportunity. So who can tell me what a moat is? An example of a moat. Patent. Patent, the classic one. So intellectual property and patents, the classic moat. Um, how about some other moats? There's a lot of moats. Regulatory um, things that might take time to get through. Yeah, yeah, regulatory things. Um, knowing how to get through that regulatory process, some kind of a know-how, and you've got a lead on that. Um, trade secrets that you have, you know, things of like structural advantages, economies of scale, Walmart, right? I mean, you just, you know, just big companies. Partnerships, sales channel partnerships. We have a company that's a private label oral care manufacturer. They are the sole source provider of private label oral care products to act to uh, Amazon. Right, so they've got a partnership with a really great sales channel. Partnership with manufacturers, partnerships with customers. Um, we had a cybersecurity company called Prolexic Technologies, and it was the largest DDoS mitigation provider, so distributed denial of service attack mitigator. And one of the things that we could do as the outsource provider of this is when you get a DDoS, everybody's familiar with a DDoS attack, they bomb your websites with a, with a lot of traffic and it takes your website down. If you remember in the uh, fall of 2012, Iran was sponsoring these DDoS attacks on our US banks and you couldn't get on your website, the bank website to do your web banking, okay? So what Prolexa could do was we would buy, so there's certain pieces of equipment, there's like 100 different types of DDoS attacks, let's say, and there's a radware type of box. That radware box will cover 65% of those attacks. So if I'm a regular company, I might buy the radware box, I might buy the Cisco box, I might buy the other, but I can't buy all the stuff. It doesn't make sense. Well, Prolexa could. We put these global scrubbing centers, we buy every piece of equipment everywhere, and then we just have engineers that did nothing and study these DDoS attacks. And when a new one came out, we'd break it, and then every single customer would have that solution. We also brought, bought huge broadband pipes to take all that garbage traffic off of our customers' websites, port it over to the scrubbing centers. Well, if you're an individual company, you can't go out and buy enormous broadband pipes in case you get a DDoS attack two years from now. So there's structural advantages, there's things that you can do. The combination of those things are your competitive advantage. And you know, if you're in that bottom right quadrant, you have that moat, then you might wanna take some capital, some equity capital, to try to capture that advantage that you have. If you have that patent, you know it's only gonna last so long. right? So how do you extract as much cash flow as you can it might, from a strategy perspective, it might make sense to actually take an equity investment in this situation if you've got a really deep, long moat with a lot of hungry alligators and you feel like your, your competitors aren't gonna come in there, it might make sense to take equity capital, even though it's a small investment, just to try to capture as much as you can in that market. One of the things that I think would be very important for you to speak to is that Many, many, many entrepreneurs think very short-sighted that they're only looking at the first 100,000 or they're only looking out as far as the first half million. They haven't thought out the barriers to entry, the competitive advantages going out three to five years out. Five years may be too long, but going out three years, and as a result, they get a year and a half into their, their runway and the moat that they thought that they had created is gone. In other words, it's a short-term versus long-term thinking um, that entrepreneurs have to adopt better than what I think they, they have to date. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, it's the ultimate challenge, right? You've got to do everything. The, the answer is your advisory board, right? Sur surrounding yourself with people, a mix of people who have a lot of different experiences, right? People who have experiences selling your product, people who have experience selling into your channel, right? Trying to, trying to create an advisory board that's gonna be the right mix of what you need where everyone's bringing a different skill set and you can kind of triangulate in on that strategy. But, you know, it is, for venture capital, you're not gonna get the venture capital unless you've got the moat figured out. You know, if you're that small business lifestyle quadrant, you might be able to get away with it because you're a small opportunity, not that many people are coming in. But it is, a, it, is a, it is a problem. Um, now, 
I'll, I'll just get to the, the upper right quadrant. So again, getting back to this concept that even if venture capital is the right fundraising strategy for you, you know, it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of merit to trying to bootstrap as far as you can to achieve as many milestones to get the MVP. Um, and let's take a look at a very simple example. I almost feel like this example is too simple because people see it and like, oh, I get it. And then I see them making the mistake later on. But you know, a couple things. When you raise uh, equity capital, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple different costs. The first thing is you'll be giving up a piece of your business, which is the pie in this metaphor. Right? You, you'll be giving up that slice of the pie to the investors. And um, if you don't think do things right, you'll end up with this piece of pie, and they end up with the other piece. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so that's called dilution, right? The second thing is that there's some hidden costs, um, which is that opportunity cost of time that we touched on earlier. Just the amount of time that it takes, it's distracting. You're a small company. You don't have a million people. You're doing 26 jobs. If you go out and you're fundraising, those 26 jobs aren't getting done. You know, so it's a really high cost, um, and uh, it takes a lot of time. And you know, again, you're could be time you could be recruiting a team, you know, product sales, all that stuff. A third thing to keep in mind is it's definitely not a badge of honor. It's actually a huge responsibility. So once you, I always tell you, the first time entrepreneur is like, you know, do not be confused. Like high net worth individuals, if they want to donate to charity, they're going to donate to charity. They're going to go to a you know a black tie function where there's a lot of alcohol and food and they get to schmooze with it. That's where they're doing. This is not charity if they're investing in your company. That you now have a, they, you've got a responsibility to them. I have in some of the courses, you'll see the equity life cycle. And basically, you know, it's like you put some money in, friends and family, the angel round, and then there's this enormous chasm until you get to that seed finance. Because that seed financing is institutional capital. C, VC, growth equity, whatever it is. And what that means is there's a professional investor there who, like Camden, raised a pool of capital from other people and is now a fiduciary to those other investors. So if you cross that chasm from angel into um, professional investors, now you've got a double responsibility because you've got a responsibility that investor has got a responsibility to a huge pool of their investors. And, um, you know, this badge of honor thing. So I lived out in um, Silicon Valley from 1998 to 2003, the height of the tech bubble, you know, and lived through this whole, hey, what does your company do? I don't know, but such and such just invested in it. And, you know, we're having our launch party, you should come, right? So again, I know this is something that, uh, that you guys teach a lot, but, uh, you know, it's worth talking about. And I'll just run through this, this quick example of two CEOs. These are two early stage CEOs. Um, the first CEO in the, low in the low column, the founders raised outside capital before they achieved a lot of milestones. So, you know, again, at a relatively low valuation, they got a uh, $500,000 um, pre-money valuation. The investors invested 500 grand. Post money's a million. Investors own 50, and they own 50. There's another early farther. They achieved more milestones. <coughs> pre-money of two and a half. Same investment of uh, 500k. Post money of three. Investors own 17%, founders own 83 Well, what happens in that second round is it compounds on itself, right? And by that second round, you better be executing really, really well, because if you're not, the investors own your business and they're gonna find somebody else who, who does. So one final, this is the final slide. Um, you know, the other thing that you can really do is recruit advisors again. When you think about strategy around fundraising, you want to surround yourself with the right people um, who can help you figure out what type of capital, when should I raise it, where should I find it, and always, always have a, the one person you absolutely need on your team is a really good lawyer, right? They're going to help you figure out some of that stuff, but do not sign anything without that really good lawyer reviewing that stuff. If I could pause for just a second because I need to be very sensitive. Ben, um, Ben Till, could you just stand up and come up for a couple of minutes? Um, sure. Deb is the CEO, the head honcho, and the, and the driver behind the Emerging Technology Center uh, in downtown Baltimore. And uh, I guess you could say 
you, you, basically, you two have basically refined, taken what you started with and you, you know, brought it to where it is. And I know you, uh, you've got a time commitment. So could you just talk about how you're using Pitch Creator and how it's working for you and what, what have you seen as the, you know, kind of the head poobah of ETC has it in, has it done what you wanted it to do for your startups? The answer is yes, it has. But we started with Jason, I think, in 2014, and we purposefully used it around our Accelerate Baltimore program. So that's where we choose the cohort of six out of any applications. We work with them for 13 weeks, and they move their product farther, or launch, or are looking for even that next round of capital. So we helped iterate, but, but my quote, which is it's like the Rosetta Stone, is I've seen pitches until the cows come home, and um, they stink. You know, and the first time somebody comes to you, and then there's the same reaction, not from an investment point of view, but they come in and it's like, no, no, no. And so what we've seen since that in the refinement of this is we're in the almost gonna be fourth year with the pitch creator and we have the demo night where somebody pitches for $100,000 and the progress is incredible that these folks make from the time they come in and tell us what they do and do the pitch to get into the program to the time they pitch to get to 100,000 and get out of the program is, I mean, it's truly amazing. But it's still, it's still a lot of work that the ETC yes. provides. So the way I would describe it is Pitch Creator gets them from zero to 50, right? They've done some of the basic work themselves. And then the ETC, you know, Deb's got a lot of volunteer mentors and advisors who fill in and basically, as they go along through the process, they're submitting those drafts. Right, the draft, pitch, read me pitch, listen to me pitch. Sometimes we'll put them in the room and we'll put nasty people in there with them and make sure that when they stand up to do it, um, somebody's saying, oh man, your baby's ugly. You know, come on, stop that, do this, right? Move a little bit. But it really is the brilliance of the pitch creator and the program. The other thing I do is not even for just the Accelerate Baltimore, which we make sure that they work through, but every new company that we've talked to, at least I have in the last, you know, three, four, five weeks, um, no, you need pitch creator. No, you need to go online. We'll help you, we'll figure it out. But he mentioned UV, yeah. and I was a judge last week at UV, and these are students, right? Student entrepreneurs. And, and I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I have never seen the, the passion and the pitch in such a way, it was remarkable. All six of them were terrific. Yeah. That's good, but yeah. you know, the thing is, it's still a lot of hard work. Well, it's very personal. So yeah. the thing yeah. is, the yeah. person, that's the other thing you said about, you know, talking about a founder. I mean, it really <coughs> is about the founder. Do you have it? Do you have the passion? Can you bring it? Are you the one that's going to actually, you know, and, and what I say about ETC, but also with this program is, ETC is really an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? And we have some very obese members. We also have a lot of anorexic, right? So you're not bringing it yourself. You have to bring it yourself, which means you have to pay attention to this, to what the advisors are saying, right? And and you really have to bring it. So, yeah. It's good. It's good. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Could we, I'd like to bring up Josh and Mustafa. Could you guys come up for a minute? I'd like to introduce Josh Smith and Mustafa Wahid, who are the founders uh, and executive team of Transitioning You. Um, I've been working with them on a number of levels. They have also been through the uh, Pitch Creator course at their level. And could you guys just talk about your experience from going through it and what you got out of it. Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Mustafa Wahid, uh, CEO of Transitioning U. We help college students graduate using their cell phones. Uh, so Jason's been very clear, giving us three key points before I hand it over to Josh. It's really, the first one was psychology. 
And so I was a biopsych major in undergrad, really understanding your customer is huge. In this case, your customer is the investor, as Jason said, and there's a way to be able to communicate to them. It reads like a term sheet. The briefing pitch was just a game changer for us because it's familiar and it makes it comfortable, which leads to the second piece, which is process, really understanding from going from angel investment or family and friends around all the way up to what does it look like to actually successfully exit a company is really important to understand and go, okay, these are the building blocks. Don't mess these up or else it's gonna be a really hard time, which led to the last piece was performance. Jason did a lot of turns on the pitch creator and you can see it and it helps the company as well transition to you. We did a lot of turns, a lot of redlining to go through and figure out what does this look like, what does this read like, and how does it make a difference? So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Josh. Yeah, I mean, I spent the last 20 some odd years training people to be teachers. And what I really appreciate about Jason's approach is he really understands teaching. He really understands a lot of things that you would need to learn is you actually need to unlearn. So when you listen to what he's saying first, it's like your gut reaction is, let's get that pitch, let's get that, you know, that show on the road, right? It's not. Is make sure you every word you say is valuable. So those go back and forth from the red line to the no, Josh, tell me again. Just tell me again. Tell me again. What are you What are you trying to say in these four sentences? Um, that is is really really important. I think that's really what helped us move us. Because once we've said that forty eight thousand times, when I get up to deliver it, it's just rolling. It's rolling off my tongue because I am very thoughtful about what you, each word means. And to have someone already have seen roadmap for us. I don't have to. You know, what I spend a lot of my time in is based on another piece of this, which is what questions am I going to get? If they know what your TAM is, if they know what the what the barriers are, if they know what that mode, what you've created, then what else could they be asking? So our team spends much more time preparing for what the questions are going to be um, than what the pitch is. We're there. We went from zero, I think, to 48 pretty quickly, but 48 to 70 was very hard. Um, and so I really appreciate you keep bringing back that, that, that time. And so I want to thank you very much for, for helping us for that. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at some of the materials that are online, just go ahead and, and, and get on it right now and spend, send it out to, to your networks. There's one thing I want, I meant to say somewhere along the line that you just reminded me of is, you know, I, I call it the foundation course because by the time you get done with this course, you're now at the beginning. Right? There's no perfect pitch. Every time you go and present, you have to research that investor and that audience, and you have to tailor your pitch to them. Right? As your business changes over time, you have to change your pitch. So what we're really trying to do is teach people the how and the why. Right? And then they still have to put in a ton of work. Right? The thing that I want anybody to think is that it's gonna be a lot of work. It's really hard. It's still hard to raise equity capital. All we're doing is giving you a framework to kind of, you know, get going so you don't waste a ton of time. But um, it's still a lot of work, but we really try to teach you the how and the why. So when you get done, I think of it as this is the basic, most, it's the minimum thing you need. It's the minimum investment summary, you know, that I can get you out there with. And it's the minimum slide deck that you need. But every time you go in, every single time, you gotta research your audience, you gotta tweak those slides up or down, you gotta learn to expand them. But at least if you have those, you've got a basis to start doing the work. That's how I think. And what I'd like to do now is we've taken up a lot of time with a highly educational um, uh, program. Let's throw it out for Q and A. Yeah. Because the heart of this is your questions and Jason being able to answer your, uh, your questions. So the floor is open to all of you. <coughs> Any of the hard questions, I'm gonna make Calvin answer them. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think your total addressable market is? Uh, you know, well, that's an interesting question. Um, if you, if I could sell this program to every single entrepreneurship professor out there, it's probably, who, every professor who teaches entrepreneurship at a college or university in the US, it's probably 10 to 15 million bucks, maybe 20 bucks a year recurring. Um, you know, there's, so I think of the market as sort of, there's the universities and there's the incubators, accelerators, um, 
there's a direct to consumer which I've done nothing with because I just do not have a lot of time. I, I need to do a campaign, do that stuff. So I know this is a nice and good <coughs> project where I have to pick my battles. I like universities because I like impact, you know, I like working with students and I like the recurring nature of it. Um, and it's still a startup in that I'm still trying to figure out the revenue model, quite honestly. I like the incubators and accelerators because you know, I work with you guys, I work with Chris, we figure out a way, um, because it, it works really well when people have a catalyst and a goal. So it really needs to be an investor pitch event that they're working towards. So in an incubator accelerator, you've got an event, and once you've got an event where entrepreneurs are pushing towards it, you can then start the course, back it up from that event and start it. The same with um, universities. They are using it when they've got a startup, or they've got like a short tank event at the end of the semester. They know, they, they know they're gonna have to get up and present, so there's a catalyst. So I found that that, in terms of where I can put my time, if I work with Incubator Accelerator, I gotta leverage up my time. Now, this concept of getting into banks um, and using it for small business loans, it's a very big market. We've talked about, and other somebody just mentioned this to me the other day, that um, it could be used in a corporate environment where in larger corporations, they are trying to pitch innovation in the, in the company. Right now it's corporate training. So I've had this, I, this has been my, my journey has been, I started with I wanna make an impact in Baltimore and create jobs, not necessarily create a big company out of it. Then it was losing money each year and I was running around teaching, I was kind of annoyed. I was like, at a minimum it needs to break even. Now I wanna get it to the point where I can hire a part-time or full-time person to do the admin so I can create more courses, which is what I really like to do, is create new content. That's the next challenge. But I never really thought about, hey, I need to create a startup because I've got a full-time job. But now I'm kind of like, well, maybe I just need to get to that next level. So it's a long explanation, but um, I think of it as different TAMs. And university TAM is 10 to 20, maybe the, you know, maybe the, um, the incubator TAM is the same, but I like those because they recur they're recurring. <coughs> the banking small business TAM is That's, huge, you and know, the corporate's huge. 5X, 10X, 50, you know, yeah. Pick, a, pick an X and, and you know, that's where it is. Yeah. You, you might be able to leverage different partnerships to access your corporate market. For example, there's a ton of Dale Carnegie type of yeah. programs out there that they're doing it, that they would love the content that you yeah. provide and license the content to them and let them hit the corporate market. It might be yeah. an easier way because you don't have the time to engage yeah. it short term. Yeah. As entrepreneurs, <clears throat> sorry, the big question for us is product market fit, right? Mm -hmm. Investors want to know how do you get product market fit. Yeah. So for you, what do you feel about your startup? Do you feel like you're at product market fit? And if so, how did you know you reached it? Uh, if yeah, you're not there, question. like what do you think you need to do to get to product market fit? I like in the university market, I think I figured it out. Um, I kind of know who my market is. Uh, and it's it's sort of um, you know, it's community colleges, it's it's people who, it's adjunct professors, who they want a tool to help them, to help their students, you know, do better presentations. And, and, and what's interesting about it is, if they don't have a Shark Tank event and they add that in, it makes the students much more engaged. The students at minimum know they're gonna have to present at the end of the class. So they're gonna be more engaged, but the more engaged in the business, the more engaged in the class, the more engaged in that idea. And that's, I mean, that's what teachers are trying. How do you create intrinsic motivation, right? So it's an intrinsic motivator. So I kind of had that figured out, but the funny thing is in the higher tier universities, they're, you know, they're, they're well, we, we don't have the problem. And if we had the problem, we wouldn't admit we had the problem. And you know we're we're much smarter than you, so we can't possibly have this problem. <laughs> so you got to like take them out of the mix, and then you've got but you've got a different mix in there. And uh, I've done nothing with that. Like I should be doing a direct email campaign to adjunct professors and things like that. But I've kind of got that piece figured out. The incubators, I feel pretty good about because that's what we started with, you know. And I know how it works. Like I know I wouldn't I wouldn't want you guys. Look, I could do a direct-to-consumer campaign, and I could probably sell a lot of courses, but I know that without that catalyst, people are gonna buy that course and not really use it, because you're gonna get busy. 
and you're gonna do something else. So I like incubators because they can help kind of, you know, and if you're working as a group, you got mentors and advisors, you can kind of help provide some of the glue that will get people through there. So I've got that one figured out. At least I know how it should work. Um, and they're both very recurring, which I like. Direct to consumer, do not have it figured out at all. I haven't had time to touch it. Banks, I see it. And I know, I know that I could create a course for a business, small business lender that would save the loan officers a ton of time. And it would educate the entrepreneurs at the same time. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Can I get in that market, can I get a someone to trial that? And I haven't even touched like the Dell Carnegie stuff. I haven't touched that at all, so I have no idea. How, that's the hardest one. That's the one I definitely don't have figured out. Because I would have to adapt it. I would have to change it for a corporate market to, um, to make it work. But I think fundamentally it would work. I just have to change the course. The other um, idea would be uh, attorney yeah. that represents the small because they, you know, I refer to the attorney Yeah, it's a good idea, thank you. Yes. Banks are like lemmings. Yeah. If you can, um, if you can get a couple of them um, working on things, that was my former life, which I, I don't miss at all. Um, if, um, do you work with the Columbia Bank at all? I have cold called them and they haven't called me back. Uh, maybe, I can, maybe I can help Fantastic, you thank you. Uh, did, did I see that you're working with UMBC? Yes. All right, there's a guy there by the name of Greg Bean who has a company called Cyber Group. I think he's still in the uh, incubator, uh, okay. not the incubator, but the uh, entrepreneurship <coughs> center. Okay. I'll give you his contact. Okay, okay great. He's developed um, he's developed a, an operating system for incubators that's installed in 150 incubators in the country. Okay. So um, I think a conversation with him might be helpful to um, talk about. I mean, those are people, those are operators that have already made the decision to absorb something into their infrastructure from outside yeah. to help them run better. Well, gee, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, that's Only great. On a different, a different level. Thank I'll, you. I'll need one of your cards. I'll see if I can connect you with the uh, CEO. Thank you very much. Jason, um, do you consider yourself in the um, bootstrap quadrant, eyeing and considering the moat quadrant? Uh, and if yeah. so, what do you think your first moat or first couple moat factors are going to have to be? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a huge moat because people can see, you know, I don't know, to me, if I'm developing, if I've got other books out there, there's other books and things out there, if I see this, it's not very hard to copy it. You know, I don't really have IP against it, um, but it is like writing a book. It's a digital book. You know, people can always take your idea. You hope they cite your idea. Um, what I've noticed though is it needs a wrap. It needs we it like when you wrap the coaching around it. When Calvin does coaching around it, it really accelerates the learning. And at the end of the day, you know, people can do not that many just pure standalone self-study programs, particularly for this kind of complexity work, I think ultimately there has to be some component to it. At a minimum, you've got to work with event mentors, advisors. You know, in a pure online education situation, you would have an asymmetric and symmetric learning um, component to it where you get online and you have a video class and video, you know, a video instructor live with another group. You know, I mean, I think that's, that's where it's going, but you know, ultimately, you know, someone, it's not that hard to, to just take the idea and use the idea. Um, so there's not a huge moat in that regard, but there's kind of a moat in terms of way that you teach it and deliver it. Purdue has a moat. Purdue has a moat still. Yeah. I mean, there's still Tyson, there's still other producers. Right, but, yeah. But they, they seized an empty position, which was, Branded commodity seize the position. Yeah. There's no identifiable expert like you in the country. Just seize it. What, what strikes me is that you are, in many ways, the product. Your background is a, in finance, yeah. investment banking, private equity. Mm -hmm. You've lived this. You've created something that's been based upon your years of experience. Mm -hmm. 
you go on stage, you present it, you talk about why it's important, how you can succeed, how you can get from a zero to 50, yeah. you have the products here that can help those companies start to do it. Yeah. You are the, you are the product in many ways. But, but I think, but the challenge here is that there's an inflection point that Jason is sitting at, and that is, yeah, the best of all possible worlds is Jason is up there every single day being and doing pitch creating. The problem is Jason has to feed his dog Buddy in the morning. And, you know, he's, so I think where pitch creator is right now is finding X number of additional Jasons who are as passionate about it as Jason is, who have some underlying, who can be taught the, you know, the stuff that needs to be taught. But it's all about scaling now. And if, if you leave it in Jason's pocketbook to do, you know, will Jason be able single-handedly to go out and do that? So one, one thing that's happening with the University of Baltimore, so I, when I developed the course, I actually gave it to someone else who was a coach, because I was running out of time to teach it, right? I didn't have an online course yet, I was just teaching it. And they couldn't really teach it the way that I teach it. But by videotaping it, the content's there, the framework's there, everything that's there, someone who's really smart and good and understands the system, like Calvin, can then do the coaching around it and really like launch it. So once you've kind of built in that zero to 50 of the video and the program and everything, it then becomes a great tool that really allows a lot of coaches to take people to the next level because it kind of cleans out an efficient way to get to that zero to 50. So that's why I work with the incubators and universities, right? Because once UB is used it that one year, right? Next year, it's the it's funding's built in, and then my only problem is, you know, how many how many nights and weekends can Calvin work for a year? <laughs> because quite frankly, he's better at the coaching than I am. He's got a lot more patience. So I'd like to throw out um, a couple of questions. Do you have a question? I do. Go ahead. So uh, thank you very much. I've created or completed the courses through Josh. Yeah. And as a new person in this area, it's been very, very helpful. So a little Good. bit of a different question. So going through the process, you, you talked about the, the revenue model. Yeah. So everything to me was pretty clear, but the revenue model seems like as I speak to people that is very subjective. Yeah. So my focus has been, as long as I have a thought out approach to the revenue model, that's gonna get me through the discussion with, with these people. Um, any feedback on that? How important it is to really have a, a revenue model that you're committed to? Yeah, I mean, the revenue model is really, really important. I think, you know, that's the, the rookie pitch is that, you know, if you don't use the course, da 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 they get done with the whole thing, and there's no revenue model. You know, I'm an investor. If you can tell me how you're gonna sell paper clips, I mean, how to great moat, and you're gonna do it at 50% margin, I'm probably really interested in investing, right? I, I'm investing again, it's not charity, so I'm really trying to think about your revenue model and then product market fit and where you are in that and are you repeatable, scalable points. Um, and it's one of the key things. The way that we teach it though is stacked, right? So if you really dissect the course, I teach the one thing that we do differently is teach the revenue model upfront early. So we call it the, the power five the problem solution revenue model TAM and your sort of your overview of your business because if you're an early stage company, there's really two things that people are betting on, the size of the market and your experience and your ability to get the company there, right? Because if you haven't figured the revenue model out. But then if you break the um, course down more, we teach the revenue model first because if you can explain that revenue model on a unit basis, a per person or per unit basis, and you know how that works, when it comes time to explain the TAM, you can do a bottom-up TAM build. Because you've already you've already convinced me of your revenue model, now you just have to explain to me why, how many people are gonna buy this iPhone at $60, because that's your revenue price, because you can make the phone at a whatever percent margin at 60, or what's your TAM if this is a $600 phone, 
What's your TAM if this is a $6,000 phone? So part of what we do is we break that down and it takes some of the pressure off of the entrepreneur because nail the revenue model first on a unit basis where your margins, it's got, so to answer your question, you gotta know it's gotta work, it's gonna be cold, test as much as you can, get as much traction as you can, that's the number one thing. But if you do that on a unit basis, it, now when you explain your TAM, you can explain a bottoms up TAM as opposed to the, this is the wrong TAM. I make software for uh, funeral homes and what's my TAM? There's, you know, the, the software market in the US is whatever billions of dollars, it's not a TAM. Your TAM is how much you can sell at your revenue model because your TAM is different at $6.60, 606000 And we do the same thing for the competition as well. The way we break the com competition down with the barriers to entry, by doing that up front, it takes a lot of pressure off the way you explain the competition because you're, you've already explained the barriers to entry so it, it makes the competition discussion less. So we also try to do that the way that we teach the stuff is to try to segment it and order it in a way that makes it as easy for you to be as successful as possible. Now I'd like for you guys to give us some feedback. You know, start up Ryan's mission. Educate, inspire, and connect. What have you guys, look, what are you taking away from tonight? What are some of the things that you're walking out of here with tonight that you didn't have when you walked in? Accelerated shortcut of the pitch creator. I'm sorry? An accelerated shortcut of the pitch creator. Just go on and do the free ones. Right there, I can see it's going to be valid. <coughs> Don't do the slide deck. Yeah. <laughs> Just that it's available. I mean, I don't know. I didn't know that that was available. So that, that, that of course, is because uh, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs who won't know um, anything about pitching or anything about trying to get Our clients are becoming smarter. So we take entrepreneurs with their products and help them enter the market faster and easier. So you're bringing us more educated consumer of our products. So I really appreciate that. And where, what, what Jason and I are, are, are working on right now is what exactly a, a long term relationship is going to be between he and I, pitch creator, and startup grind. Because what we want to do, part of my long-term vision is to create an entire educational programming um, offering through Startup, through our chapter. And so Jason and I are exploring what that may look like. And I think what's going to happen is I probably will end up having Jason teach me and then I can be able to you know, help leverage you know, what he's doing. But it's something that we are going to be putting into the Startup Ryan Columbia chapter um, um, we're hoping before the end of this year. So you you wanted to say something about an offer. Yeah, I mean, I will give, you know, I know people pay to come to the event, so you know, I, I will give you a discount code for $50 off the course okay. if you want to buy it individually. However, I know if you as a group will be much more successful if we can do it as the incubator course and you've got an end goal and there's a pitch competition as a prize, and you're geared up on it, and we've got mentors about and we're all like aligned and we're kind of mm -hmm. gunning for it. So I would actually prefer to do it that way. Yep. Okay. But I, I will certainly send, you know, I will send a discount code to you for a discount for people who, you know, for, for whatever reason need need it sooner. Okay. Um, Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Any, any other thoughts and comments before we wrap up? Yeah. Yeah, Terry. So if you were to have a pitch competition, partners throwing something for the prize? <laughs> well, it's funny you should ask, because Pitch Creator just threw in the Hustle 500 prize for the UB um, students. You know, for students, some of them actually had a side hustle with real businesses, and um, some of them had ideas, and we wanted, Calvin and I wanted to figure out a way where, you know, we could really kind of motivate everybody to feel like they, you know, if you just were coming up with an idea, and you happen to make it to the finals. You know, you had a shot of winning something, so we created this Hustle 500 money jar, which is basically a, a mason jar filled with 20s rolled up, and it was $500 to the person who made the most improvement during the coaching process, and um, it, was, it was really good because the person who won that Hustle 500 
didn't actually win because the people who won the first and second place had actual real businesses. So Pitch Creator will do it. I don't know if Camden will do it. <laughs> pitch Creator will do it. Anybody else? Yes? Um, so why are Well, um, I'll, <coughs> let, me share, let me share this with you, and that is we, we are in discussions right now on two things. One is to take treble, and once we have proven the treble concept here in Columbia, mid-Maryland, the global organization is very interested in the possibility of rolling it out as, as an incredibly effective inter-community communications tool. So that's one. The second thing is I've already kind of, I've already started to lay the groundwork of looking at what, it's, what it would be look like to bring Pitch Creator into the startup grind global community. That is, that is a discussion I will continue to have and it will be high on my list of things to do when I'm out at the global conference, but we gotta do first things first. And I better be able to put together a use case and a proof of concept and a success story within the chapter first before we can take it to the next level. But it's on it's, it's on our roadmap. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to wish you all a tremendously happy Thanksgiving. Please be safe. I hope that you leave here with one piece of education, one level of inspiration, or one connection that you didn't have when you walked in. If you have, then we've done our job as a chapter. Thank you all, and hopefully we'll see